everyone, and welcome to Montgomery County Council's Tuesday, May 4th session. I have some sad news to share. First, Councilmember Katz's father-in-law has passed. We send our heartfelt condolences to Councilmember Katz, to his wife, Sally, um, to their children and their entire family, and we'll, we'll certainly keep them in our thoughts and prayers. He asked that other members of the Public Safety Committee, Councilmember Albernaz and I, uh, read the second proclamation um, uh, recognizing some of our police, and I'll uh, take his part, I guess, in the AAPI proclamation, the third one. We begin with three proclamations this morning. The first is to recognize Teacher Appreciation Day. Uh, let me call on Council Members Fritza and Rice. Thank you to Council President and our condolences as well to the Katz family, Sally and her whole family as well. Uh, I am uh, privileged and honored to join our Education and Culture Committee chair today to uh, recognize our teachers who uh, we appreciate every day, uh, but uh, especially uh, on Teacher Appreciation Day and who we understand uh, all the work that they uh, do, the sacrifices that they make every year uh, and particularly uh, this year. Uh, there are few things on this earth that have a greater impact on a child's life than their teachers. We owe so much to our educators over the years for inspiring us, for challenging us, sometimes frankly, and especially in my case, for just putting up with us. Uh, none of us on this virtual dais would have gotten here without the support, hard work, and dedication of our teachers, the inspiration that they provided us, the knowledge that they imparted uh, in us. Their impact goes well beyond the confines of the classroom where they teach and lasts far longer than the year in which we're lucky enough to have them. That's true for all of us, and it's a particularly true for me. I am so pleased we have three special guests uh, today, all of whom uh, are highly deserving, but one of whom uh, holds a special place in my past. Uh, my uh, former teacher, one of my favorite uh, all-time teachers, Mr. Keller, uh, John Keller has uh, joined us here. He was my eighth grade social studies and homeroom teacher at Hoover Middle School and was my student government advisor for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, so I like to think of him as my very first political advisor uh, and uh, starting my career uh, very young as a student activist and advocate and uh, student government uh, member. I still remember some of our assignments in his class, including uh, identifying every single cultural reference in Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire and writing the final verse with cultural references of our choosing that brought it from 1989 to, to when I have them and uh, uh, when we had them, which for me was the final decade. Uh, he's now the head of the BCC Democratic Breakfast Club, carrying on his legacy of engaging local residents like he did so passionately as a teacher for so many years. Welcome, Mr. Keller. I, I also wanted to recognize Danilia Wilson, who is a teacher and is here on behalf of uh, the Montgomery County Education Association. She is a first grade teacher at Wheaton Elementary School. She has been teaching there for the last eight years. Uh, and she uh, says, like so many other teachers, that the best part of her teaching experience is the students that she has. Uh, she told us that uh, teaching children who are so young uh, is so fun and exciting. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, her hard work, her dedication, and her being here uh, to represent uh, all of the uh, teachers uh, in the public school system. Uh, and, and with that, uh, we're gonna hear from uh, uh, all three of our special guests uh, after Council Member Rice and I uh, read the official proclamation. But before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to my friend and colleague and our Education and Culture Chair so he can introduce our last guest and make some, a, a few remarks as well. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me, Councilmember Friedson. And um, I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of teachers. Uh, in fact, it's very personal to me because many of you know I'm the son of a teacher, then principal, then university administrator. And so I've lived the life of knowing uh, just how important the role uh, that my mother played in people's lives. And I know the important role that each of you play in your lives. So important, in fact, that I remember, and this is why I'm so happy to be able to introduce uh, Mr. Bostic, that my mother actually went to my school at Belfry Elementary School and said, why is my son not having any teachers of color? Um, why does he not have a single solitary person to teach him? And why do we not have diversity 
in our schools. It's important for my son to see that. And so I'm so proud to be able today to introduce uh, Mr. Bostic, who not only uh, continues to crusade for growing uh, diversity in our workforce uh, by promoting uh, and retaining uh, male educators of color <clears throat> through his bond program, uh, but who also sets the example himself uh, as a phenomenal teacher, a person who continues to outreach to his students, uh, and who has been named Montgomery County Teacher of the Year. So it is phenomenal. Uh, and the great thing is, and it, I, I, I'm just going to say now, I have no voting <laughs> in how this happens, but I'm very proud to say that he is at Dr. Martin Luther King Middle School right in Germantown, Maryland, where many of you know I live, the area I represent. So I'm doubly proud, uh, proud in the sense that we get to highlight our great teachers today, <clears throat> as we should every day. Uh, but then also uh, to be able to see someone who's working in a community uh, that represents uh, many children of color, many children of lower socioeconomic means, but does not let that area determine those children's future, uh, who makes sure that he stands up for whenever a child learns critical thinking, somewhere a conspiracy theory dies. We did some research on you, Mr. Bostic, and saw that meme, so uh, we got that for you. And I'm just going to close with this last piece because it's incredibly important. It's, it's the future of teaching, and it's what we see happening with teachers like Danilia, with teachers like uh, Mr. Bostic, uh, where, where it is one in which they're using new methodologies to help to teach their students, using data to help in adjust instruction, uh, to make sure that they're reaching their children. And if there's not a uh, topic that's grasped, figuring out a new way to teach it so that you can ensure that they're not missing that core element that's important. These are the things that our teachers do each and every day. And I wanna make sure that as my good friend, Council Member Duando says, for the millions that are watching at home, I want you to just pause for a moment and think about the last time you tried to teach something to your child and how difficult it was and the repetitiveness that was there and the sometimes frustration you had. Uh, but because of the love and care, you kept going at it. Well, that's what our teachers do each and every day, every waking hour that they're in the classroom. That's what they do because they love and because they care. And so we owe a debt of gratitude for our community being the great place that it is because of the strength of our teachers in Montgomery County and for teachers like Joseph Bostic. I turn it back to you, Mr. Friesen. Thank you, uh, Council Member Rice, and uh, congratulations, Mr. Bostic, on behalf of all of us on your well-deserved recognition and welcome. I just wanted to thank Mr. Keller, Ms. Wilson, and you, Mr. Bostic, and uh, for all of our students, for all of our families. Uh, we are, as a county, only as good as our education system and the students that we can inspire and the talent that we can cultivate in order to build a stronger, better economy and a more civilized society. So thank you for everything that you have done. I am also the son of a former uh, teacher, a um, former Montgomery County Public School teacher, uh, in fact, uh, and so uh, uh, great to, to, to join as well. So now we'll, we're going to read the uh, proclamation. This is a proclamation of, of the Montgomery County Council. Whereas there are more than 18,000 teachers currently working in Montgomery County in public and private schools, providing compassion, patience, understanding, knowledge, and creativity to students of all levels. And whereas teachers impart wisdom, engage imaginations, advocate for their students, and create a nurturing class environment every day and with impact lasting beyond their teaching years. And whereas outside of classroom time, teachers spend countless hours preparing for classes, tutoring, coaching, and continuing to be a part of students' lives, encouraging diverse thoughts, skills, and talents. And whereas teachers are resilient, and deserve sincere gratitude for their part in forming the innovative minds that serve Montgomery County and the world now and in future for generations to come. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes Teacher Appreciation Day and be it further resolved that the County Council honors teachers, educators, and those who have committed to students of all kinds 
to provide the world with new passions and lasting knowledge. Presented on this fourth day of May in the year 2021, signed by myself, Council Member Rice, and Council President Tom Hucker. Congratulations, happy Teacher Appreciation Day, and thank you uh, on behalf of all of us for everything that you do and have done and, uh, and, and will continue to do uh, to inspire future generations uh, to come the ripples of your impact will continue to benefit our county uh, as we move forward and um, with that uh, i'd like to turn to uh, mr keller uh, normally he would call on me but now i get to call <laughs> on him uh, so uh, with that uh, mr keller if you have a few brief remarks thank you andrew um when it is open i'm a docent of the library of congress and perhaps the most iconic um piece of art there is the Elohu vetters um a Minerva, and there are a number of objects in the picture, and we talk about them. And I asked the group, why do you think there's an owl there? Well, of course, because it's a symbol of wisdom, and it can see things from many directions. So I tell my touring group, I had this student once who had this remarkable talent. My um, partner, Holly, Holly, and I were out um, for lunch one day with Andrew, and there was an upcoming race um, for the county executive, among other things. And I asked Andrew about the two most formidable candidates who at that time were running for the office. And he proceeded to describe the strengths and weaknesses of the first candidate, and then did the same with the second candidate. And not only, in my opinion, was he right on, but he gave no hint of what his own preference might be. And so I'd say to my group, during, I'd say that's, to me, the, the um, indicator of an educated person who can see things from many points of view, doesn't agree with them necessarily, but can thoroughly understand and explain where that person is coming from. So I spent 44 years of my life following my passion, which was to be a teacher. And I was blessed to meet just outstanding young people like Andrew Friedson. So I'm grateful to my um, friend and um, former student and now council member, Andrew Friedson. Thank you so much, Mr. Keller. I really touched by your words and comments. I'd love to turn it over now to Ms. Wilson. Thank you. I'm honored to speak on behalf of my 14,000 colleagues in Montgomery County Schools. This year, even more than most, educators have been proving that education is not a building or grades. It's a connection with our students and a drive to see them succeed. So last month, or last March, I'm sorry, MCPS closed buildings for two weeks. And as we watched this global pandemic grow and those two weeks become a year, we had to adapt learning to a virtual environment. We supported students who had no internet, who had no Chromebooks, and who were scared for their families. And educators did this as we were dealing with the effects of COVID in our own homes. So as Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. And day after day, educators did. We showed up for our students and communities, and we continue to work for all of the families in Montgomery County. I do wanna thank the council for their leadership in this unprecedented time and for recognizing the work of educators. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everything that you and so many other teachers have done. I now turn it over to Mr. Bostic, Teacher of the Year. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. And uh, thank you to all of our colleagues in Montgomery County Public School System. Uh, through this challenging time, it's been very important to have your leadership and what you're doing for our communities. Uh, there's a Chinese proverb that says, if you're planning for a year, sow rice. If you're planning for a decade, plant trees. If you're planning for a lifetime, educate people. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. The work that we're doing is important, and we help our students prepare to be lifelong learners, critical thinkers, and problem solvers. Thank you for continuing to encourage all students to invest in increasing their knowledge because knowledge is food and knowledge is power. Thank you teachers for continuing to use your superpowers daily to help students tap into their superpowers and become the best version of themselves. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you so much, Mr. Bostic. Uh, thank you to all of you, Mr. Keller, Ms. Wilson. I'll just say that our education system isn't about the quality of test scores, but the quality of our teachers. And you all represent that so well and uh, really appreciate everything that you have done and will continue to do. And uh, we are a, a quality community because of our teachers and our education system. And thanks for representing that Teacher Appreciation Day. Thank you, guys. Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Keller, Mr. Bostic, uh, and congratulations for 
and to all to you and all our amazing teachers for all your service and sacrifices you made this year um, and your continued dedication to our students. Thank you, colleagues. Next, we'll recognize the MCPD officers who responded to the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. And with Council Member Katz out, uh, Council Vice President Albernoz and I will um, begin and then turn it over to Chief Jones. Welcome, Chief Jones. Um, good morning. Good morning. On January 6th, our country faced the worst attack on our democracy since the Civil War, when a violent pro-Trump mob stormed the United States Capitol, resulting in the death of five individuals. This day will forever be familiar, would be remembered as a dark day for our country. The attack on our nation's capital was an attack on our democracy, our Congress, and our residents. The Confederate flag breached the U.S. Capitol, something that never happened during the Civil War. With law enforcement vastly outnumbered on the Capitol grounds, officers from the, the Montgomery County Police Department answered the call. Without hesitation, our MCPD officers bravely responded to the crisis to restore peaceful operations and ensure the safety of our congressional leaders. Today, we are privileged to be joined by those MCPD officers who bravely responded to the crisis and helped preserve our democracy on that horrible day. The selflessness with which they act every day, their willingness to put their lives on the line could not have been more apparent than it was on January 6th. I'm honored to recognize each and every one of these officers for their efforts, not just on January 6th, but for every day. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Chief Jones. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Council Member Albert Nose. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me just begin by um, expressing my condolences to the Katz family uh, and Sally uh, for their terrible loss. Uh, our hearts are with them, and, and we are certainly praying for them. Um, January 6th was, was such a dark day. Uh, the, the images that we saw subsequent to that day are ingrained in my mind. Uh, as Americans, we all recognize the tragedy of that day, but as Washingtonians, it cut even deeper uh, to see monuments that we revere and that we all as Washingtonians have some level of responsibility to protect that goes beyond your average citizen in the United States. Although that day was dark and tragic and overwhelming, I there were two specific areas that gave me a great deal of hope. And first was the tremendous response of our first responders. The way that they joined together across our entire region to protect and serve not just all of us individually, but on that day, our very democracy was truly inspirational. They were spit on, they were abused, they were racial epithets that were charged against our uh, officers of color that day. A Montgomery County police officer was struck in the head and received a concussion. And I know that the ramifications of that day still run deep for all those that participated. This is a difficult job on a good day, but that day was truly unprecedented. The second thing that gave me hope that day was is that democracy forged ahead and our congressional and federal representatives continued to go about the business of that democracy. And so I was truly inspired by the heroic efforts of our Montgomery County Police Department, as they do every day, um, try to step forward and protect and serve our entire community. And again, on that day, our very democracy. So thank you um, for your leadership on that day and every day. And with that, I turn it over to you to Chief Jones to say a few words as well. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning to uh, Council President uh, Hucker and Council Vice President uh, Albernaz, and I also, from the Montgomery County Police family, also um, extend our, our deepest uh, sympathies to the Katz family, um, um, to, to uh, Sydney and uh, Sally, um, and Sally on the loss of her father. So, uh, I don't know. can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you. So um, again, thank you all for for recognizing um, what I deem true heroes on on January sixth. Um, it is um, it was amazing um, that we would be called to such um, such an event. Um, we had um, already been um, notified by the Metropolitan Police Department prior to uh, January sixth um, by Acting Chief Conti who wanted, um, wanted us to, to come down to work with them as partners um, in order to keep the District of Columbia safe um, during that week due to the uh, un 
basically unforeseen, but we were prepared for other events to, that were going to possibly occur within the city. Um, and on that very day, I am, I've never been so proud of our, our men and women who responded um, down on January 6th, um, led by our special events response team um, here. I think um, joining me today is Lieutenant uh, Peter Davidoff, who has been one of our uh, primary experts on um, special events response team activities and how we handle um, um, protest and um, violent uh, encounters. And on that day, it was truly uh, a day of a violent encounter um, that those officers without hesitation were one of the first teams um, able to respond to assist the Capitol Hill, Hill Police that day, uh, U.S. Capitol Police, as well as the Metropolitan Police Department in order to make, uh, to keep our democracy and to keep that institution and the folks who worked in, um, and are dedicated at the Capitol to keep them safe. Um, and I must report out that is unfortunate that uh, we still have uh, the officer who, uh, the executive officer who actually sustained the concussion is still out of work uh, today and still is suffering from his injuries. And we're still uh, praying for his recovery. But uh, this is when, again, we never know when we're put on the front lines. But I want to thank the council today uh, for recognizing the officers um, um, who, who stood um, in front of uh, trouble in order, and they went to the trouble in order to secure the capital and thank you so much for recognizing uh, the, that heroic act on that particular day. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, Lieutenant Davidoff, Lieutenant Clark, do you have anything to add or should we read the proclamation? Thank the Chief from the Special Operations Division. Thank the Chief for his uh, his remarks and the council as well. And uh, I think you probably are better off with the proclamation rather than me speaking. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'll note that each of the officers involved received a separate certificate of thanks from the council. So uh, Council Vice President, if you're ready, I'll begin proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Whereas on January 6, 2021, our country experienced an unprecedented attack when the United States Capitol was stormed during a riot and violent attack against the United States Congress. This insurrection endangered our democracy, our nation, and our residents nationwide, as well as here in Montgomery County. And? Whereas the proximity of our jurisdiction to our nation's capital both requires and enables mutual aid at critical junctures, and? Whereas during the insurrection, officers who risked their own safety from the Montgomery County Police Department were requested to assist other law enforcement officers in and around the United States Capitol building and? Whereas we are grateful to our law enforcement personnel who responded without hesitation to restore peaceful operations and ensure the safety of our congressional leaders and our neighbors in Washington, D.C., all while encountering damage to property, extensive vandalism, and dangerous physical attacks. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby extends its deep gratitude and appreciation to those who risk their own safety as members of the Montgomery County Police Department to help preserve our democracy and our nation's capital on January 6, 2021. And furthermore, let it be known that their bravery and selflessness is commended. Presented on this fourth day of May in the year 2021, signed by Council Member Katz and myself. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you all so very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, next, uh, we will celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I'm proud to recognize Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and celebrate all of the amazing contributions of our AAPI community. Our Asian American and Pacific Islander community is one of our largest and most diverse communities in the county. We are so lucky to have excellent community partners and organizations that promote an appreciation of the heritage and rich history of their diverse AAPI communities. I'm especially grateful to our many community partners and residents who have gone above and beyond to help our neighbors, especially this year throughout the pandemic. It's so heartening to see how our communities have banded together to help each other through this difficult time. I also must recognize the despicable violence that's been directed at the AAPI community, which was already at a high level prior to the pandemic. As we know, the pandemic has sadly exacerbated this problem. 
It'll take work from all of us to end this unspeakable violence. I'm so proud that our United States Senate resoundingly passed an anti-Asian hate crimes bill to bolster law enforcement response to the rising attacks on the Asian American community. And I was pleased to see Governor Hogan create a work group to address the rise in anti-Asian violence. This is an area where the two parties can come together and we can truly make our community safer against these awful acts of hate and violence. Here in Montgomery County, our values of inclusion, compassion, tolerance, opportunity, and sacrifice for others are the reason people who have, cho have chosen to call this place home. I'll now call on uh, Mayor Modi, Ariana Ong, and Dr. Nguyen to speak. Let me first recognize a mover and shaker and glass ceiling breaker and history maker, Senator Susan Lee, first Asian American to represent Montgomery County in the Maryland General Assembly. Senator Lee. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Tom Hucker. I'd like to thank the, your wonderful colleagues on uh, the County Council. Of course, my, uh, Councilman Friedson, Abernaz, Rice, Reamer, Navarro, Jawando, Glass, and Katz, and my condolences again to the Katz family. Um, you are a wonderful County Council, and you make us so proud. Uh, and thank you for letting us uh, celebrate uh, Asian American uh, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and providing this wonderful proclamation. You know, for hundreds of years, uh, generations of uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders, through their talent, their hard work, uh, have built America and made it the global leader that it is today. And today our new immigrants are building on this foundation laid by the earlier generations. And of course, the history of America would be incomplete without including the history of the contributions made by our AAPIs from uh, building, of course, the railroads to developing medical and technological breakthroughs and uh, launching an online and digital revolution like uh, Zoom, which we're on right now, and uh, working tirelessly at the forefront uh, to, as healthcare providers and uh, first responders to save lives and of course, serving in our U.S. Armed Forces, like uh, my own dad, Harry Lee, who was a World War II U.S. Navy veteran who defended freedom on the perilous Atlantic Pacific and was part of what they called the ge greatest generation. And they defended freedom during the darkest times in world history. Um, we, of course, have much to be proud of uh, in our community. Uh, we made tremendous strides. But of course, as, as uh, the President Hucker said, this has been a very difficult year for our community because of COVID-19, the scapegoating that has been occurring, the toxic and political rhetoric uh, created by former President uh, Donald Trump and some of the highest uh, elected individuals in government by calling the virus uh, Kung Flu or China virus, which is, of course, contributed to the 150% increase in attacks against our wonderful community and put a bullseye on the backs of our grandparents and our parents and our children. So it's a dangerous situation, but acts of uh, this kind of bias, they are unacceptable and they're un-American because we are not foreigners, we are Americans. And when you attack us, you attack all Americans and all those principles and values we hold dear. So I'm so proud of our council president, Tom Hucker and his colleagues, county council members, our county executive, Mark Elridge, and my own Senate President, Bill Ferguson, and our House Speaker, Adrian Jones, and of course, our congressional delegation, particularly my Congressman, Jamie Raskin, and of course, our wonderful President, Joe Biden, and Vice President, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, the first woman, an Asian and Black uh, American uh, to ever hold this high office of fight. We're, we're so proud of her. Uh, and. Um, I, I'd like to also uh, thank you for speaking up and standing with us, because uh, when you do that, you send a clear message that this is not tolerated. And I also like to, to say I'm working with the Columbia University professor, Agnes Xu Tang, on her nationwide information campaign called the uh, Yellow Whistle Project, uh, which uh, she's donated hundreds of thousands of these whistles to distribute it to our community nationwide. And we in Maryland are getting 20,000 of them. So anyway, this is a special month for us. And I thank you, Council President uh, Hucker and all my wonderful council members for letting us celebrate this joyful day with us. Uh, and we are gonna make this a better world for all of us in future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. Thanks to you and all your colleagues too for everything you did for us during the General Assembly session. Uh, Judge Bach, welcome. 
thank you. Uh, I just can't thank you enough to the uh, our uh, Montgomery County Council for promoting inclusion and diversity and combating uh, uh, bias and hate against uh, uh, people of color. And the I really appreciate uh, your work in recognizing the significant contributions Asian Americans uh, have made. Uh, to the United States and this state and this county. And Asian Americans have sacrificed, uh, made ultimate sacrifice for the good of this country since the Civil War. And yet often we are being portrayed as uh, foreigners and the, uh, that has uh, created this uh, violence and hate against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and your work in Montgomery County makes things uh, far better for our community. And I just want to thank all of you for your proactive approach to uh, fighting these uh, uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hong. Thank you, Council President Hucker. On behalf of the Montgomery County Progressive Asian American Network, I want to thank the Council for holding this virtual event to kick off Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And also um, thank you to the County Executive for holding a similar event this past weekend. I'm also grateful for your support um, through the Unity event that you held after the Atlanta shootings, a couple of public um, safety town halls and a schools community meeting. The proclamation is very much appreciated. It's in the spirit of the federal law that designated May as a month to celebrate API history, contributions, and challenges. APIs have a lot of stories to tell. Stories about immigration, whether it's in search of the American dream or sanctuary because of US colonialism, military engagement, or foreign policy in Asia. Stories about people I can introduce you to a Montgomery County resident who recalls the dust still to this day that would kick up through the wood slats in the temporary housing that he lived during the Japanese American incarceration camps in the desert. Stories about contributions. API pioneers have traversed space, designed US landmark monuments, um, discovered cures and spurred innovation in Silicon Valley among many other things and ordinary heroes have served as frontline healthcare workers during the pandemic. Are you aware that one in 11 nurses are APIs and mainly Filipino immigrants? Stories about challenges. APIs are no stranger to racism. They challenge discriminatory immigration laws, school, dis aggregation, uh, school desegregation, and alien land laws. And knowing that a rising tide lifts all boats, APIs have joined in the civil rights struggles of the 60s, the Black Lives Movement, and sent 120,000 folded, hand-folded paper cranes to the U.S. as a protest message calling for the closure of ICE detention camps. So we have a mandate to tell these stories. Um, as the previous speakers mentioned, there were 3,800 anti-Asian incidents nationwide this past year and two mass shootings in the past six weeks that claimed 10 AAPI lives of 16 victims. Our prevention strategy are these stories. So to that end, we're happy to offer resources for any county agency that would like to incorporate API stories in their diversity trainings or events or to consult on inclusion strategies. Thank you again for inviting us to share in this commemoration today. It's been a privilege. Thank you, Ms. Ong. Uh, Mr. Modi, congrats and thanks again for the great event I saw in White Oak this weekend. Please, go ahead. Thank you, County President uh, uh, and uh, County uh, Council members and Senator Lee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the today's Asian American Heritage Month uh, event. And it has been my honor to be associated with our prolific uh, diverse community here in Montgomery County. Our county is outstanding and uh, example of diverse uh, cultures coming together under one umbrella. Over the past year, we have shown what unity in diversity looks like by coming together to fight the pandemic and racial injustice. 
our diverse culture has been inspiration and uh, to start the american diversity group it has been a pleasure and honor to serve our asian community and honor to serve other communities as well we are committed to serve our country and be responsible citizen of this country and the county thank you so much thank you so much and dr win On behalf of the Asian American Health Initiative Steering Committee, um, I want to first express our sympathy to to um, Council Member Cass and his family for the recent loss. And I want to express our appreciation to Council President Harker and the County Council for hosting the event today for the proclamation celebrating the AAPI Heritage Month of May. And the recognition of the Asian American contribution to this county, to this country, and that the mem and we are the member of the community here in Montgomery County is crucial and comforting um, in the environment today. As the previous speaker had mentioned, that we believe that the rich and diverse heritage that Asian American can bring to this country is valuable and it can add to the beauty that we have and want to promote here in this country and in the county. So I believe that we continue, the Asian American community can and will continue to contribute to that collective community that we have so we can bring and help to make Montgomery County a better and healthier place to live. I want to emphasize that even though we are diverse, we, are met, we have different paths, but we have a lot of things in common that our share humanity. And with that, we want to celebrate this month in that common sense, to the common that we have so that we can work together as one community moving forward. Thank you to the council and for your leadership during that difficult years in 2020 and this year as we move forward to continue to fight against a pandemic and the challenge that we face in the county. And we're looking forward to continue to working with you uh, to celebrate the diversity that we have in this county. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, Mr. Shen, anything to add? Did I leave anybody out? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Council President Hunter. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the Council for um, holding the solidarity event after the mass shooting in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I also want to thank um, Chief Jones, uh, Senator Lee, and, and various elected officials that spoke out against anti-Asian hate and violence. Um, and I also want to thank nonprofits that wrote letters of support to the Asian community condemning these uh, anti-Asian hate and violence. And, and I want to single out the Jewish Community Relations Council, who in March of 2020 mm -hmm. wrote a letter saying that they, they stood against um, anti-Asian sentiments, and they, they recognize that there's a growing uh, concern, and they, they stand with the Asian community. Uh, it, it, this is at the beginning of the pandemic, and and you know they're like the the, the basically the first nonprofit that I heard from, and and, and I just want to really thank them for for everything. Um, as Ariani said earlier, API Heritage Month is a celebration of our uh, history heritage our contribution while recognizing the challenge that Asians have gone through in in uh, the United States. So take time to learn about our history, take time to learn about our culture, take time to learn about our struggles. And, and um, you know, it's through education that we can um, achieve unity with every group. And, and, and the one thing I want to say is we if you watch any sporting event, as soon as one person chant USA, Everybody chants USA. It's time to start acting like it. And um, I, I just want to end with uh, may the fourth be with you all. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Okay. Um, now we can read the proclamation. Each council member will read one clause. I'll begin with the proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month is recognized nationally throughout the month of May to honor the irreplaceable roles that these communities have played in our past and to celebrate the contributions made by generations of Asian American and Pacific Islanders to American history, society, and culture. And 
Whereas Montgomery County residents of Asian and Pacific Islander heritage come from all parts of Asia and the Pacific Islands of uh, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. And? Whereas more than 161,600 county residents identify themselves as Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders, which represents more than 15% of our population and approximately 70% hail from 37 different countries of origin and? Whereas one of the most culturally and linguistically diverse groups in America, the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities remind us that while we all have distinct backgrounds and origins, we share the same hopes and aspirations for ourselves and our community and? Whereas in commemorating this month, we recognize the rich heritage of our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities who continue to preserve, preserve and persevere in order to provide more opportunities for future generations and? I'll read Council Members Katz as well. Whereas this year's Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month theme is elevating Asian American and Pacific Islander voices in public service, advocacy, and popular culture. And whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders advocate across our community are using their voices to fight anti-Asian hate and to create a more equitable and just society. And whereas Asian American and Pacific Islander trailblazers are succeeding each day to help shape the county's future and add their voices and experiences to make our community a better place to live, work, raise a family, and whereas Together, we recommit ourselves to embrace the diversity that enriches our county and to ensure that all people have an equal opportunity to succeed. Now, therefore be it resolved, Council President. Therefore be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, presented on the fourth day of May in the year 2021, signed by myself. Thanks to all of you for everything you're doing to make our community stronger and safer. We greatly appreciate all your contributions and look forward to continue to work together. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you all so much. Do we need okay, to Pardon me? Council Member Bremer. I was just gonna ask, do we need to leave and come back in or is, is are we at the right link now? I guess we're in the right link. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we are. Thanks, I thought you were gonna close us out. I was happy to. Um, now, and thanks Council Member Navarro for filling in Council Member Katz's place. Okay, now we'll have uh, general business. Madam Clerk, please share announcements, agenda changes or petitions. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Council Members. We do have an addendum this morning. Under general business, A, announcements, the public a correction, the public hearing on Bill 15-21, solicitation of vehicle occupants and high-speed roadways, permit required, scheduled for May 11, 2021 at 1.30 p.m., has been postponed and will be rescheduled at a future date. On the consent calendar, item 6H, introduction, supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY21 operating budget, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service, $956,513 to provide a COVID-19 nominal fee stipend for active volunteer members and to restore association support, nominal fee, and length of service award program adjustment. Source of funds, fire fund, undesignated reserves. That item has been deleted. Correction, 5H on the... Five, I'm sorry, just five. Introduction, suspension of the rules action, solicitation to indicate the council's intent to approve or reject provisions of the collective bargaining agreement with the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association action request to suspend rules of procedure, rule 7C, to allow immediate action. And finally, deleted item 10, action and resolution to indicate the council's intent to approve or reject provisions of the collective bargaining agreements with MCVFRA. That is all, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The clerk has also distributed the minutes to council members for the meetings of January 25th, 26th, 29th, and February 2nd, 4th, 8th, and 9th, 2021. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection, the minutes are approved as submitted. 
Now we can all sit as the Board of Health. Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard, are we ready for, are you ready for our briefing? Dr. Bridgers, welcome. Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Gales. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gales, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and happy Tuesday. Um, I was um, thankful for the opportunity to be able to sit in and listen to part of the previous presentations. Um, quite insightful, uplifting, and uh, it is quite timely that we need to all work together um, as a society to continue to move forward in a unified manner. Uh, I will uh, attempt to share my screen. All right, it's not working. One second. Give me one more second, I'm sorry. Okay, I think we've got it fixed now. Okay. Actually, want to share this other screen first. Okay, uh, we looking at the daily COVID nineteen report. Okay, I just wanted to before talking about our vaccine numbers and so forth, wanted to show you where we stand uh, in terms of our community transmission levels. Uh, we have talked about this before. Uh, when we look at these are the test positivity numbers, uh, Montgomery County is at 2.02%. We actually yesterday dropped below, uh, the day before we're below two. Um, and so our average, the state average is at 3.69. And you see where we stand in comparison to all of the other counties. I believe we are only second to Kent County in terms of test positivity numbers. When we uh, similarly, when we look at our case rates compared to other jurisdictions, you can see this is where we were yesterday. Our case rate has dropped to 6.64 cases per 100,000 residents. And you can see how we stack up against other counties across the state. So to pivot uh, within that, a couple of general announcements before talking about vaccines. Uh, we obviously continue to monitor our community transmission numbers, uh, continue to look at the impact of variant strains within our community. We do know that the B117 or the UK variant continues to be the predominant strain, although there has been reports of an uptick in cases of the Brazilian variant or the P1 variant variant of COVID-19. We again have had all uh, cases, including all of those different variants reported throughout our community. Uh, so let's move through our slides fairly, go through this fairly quickly to save room for questions and discussions. Uh, this is again another schematic to show our uh, community transmission levels in terms of our case rate. You can see that we are continuing Dr. Gales, to see Dr. Gales, would you mind? I can't hear you. Can you make it in view mode, like a full screen? Just so, you know, uh, the, are you able to do that? Uh, okay, maybe not. All right, don't worry about it. It's just, it's a little. Might be on our end. Yeah, okay. Thank are you. you. Are you able to help with that? Thank you. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Part of the challenge is, is this file is extremely large and it's, I think, about a 12 megabyte file that makes it impossible to download um, into the PowerPoint. So here we are for our, our transmission levels. You can see we, we're seeing and continuing to see improvements there. Uh, when we look at our vaccine numbers, uh, we have continued to make uh, improvements in terms of the percentage of our residents covered. We've got 54% of our residents having received at least one dose. And again, this information is pulled from our Immunet data in Maryland. We try to reconcile a number of different sources, including our state data, as well as that with CDC to get a, a, a good number. But this is pulled from CRISP and Immunet. We've got 54% of our residents having received at least one dose. The statewide average is 45%. 
And we now have hit over 38% of our residents being fully vaccinated, having received both doses or the single Johnson and Johnson dose compared to 32% by the state. And then you see how we stack up against other counties um, across the state on the right side, and then you see the percentage breakdown for our younger populations. Now, this is of importance because we've been had great success in getting our older populations covered. Uh, we now have, uh, we, look, we see close to 80% of those age groups being fully vaccinated. We're continuing to see increases in the percentage for the 40 to 64 year old group. The area that seems to be lagging behind is our 17 to 39 year olds. Um, and we actually see a good, the, the 17 and up being, you know, the 17 year olds, um, we, we are seeing a good number of those getting covered. Now, we only currently have one vaccine again that has been approved for 16 and up, that's Pfizer. There was an announcement yesterday that the FDA will likely have their hearing for uh, their EUA hearing to get that drop, that age limit drop to 12, potentially as early as next week. And we continue to work behind the scenes with our community partners and our partners in education, both non-public and public schools devise some strategies around being able to provide some vaccine opportunities to those younger groups. I think we'll probably have more success with those groups and that donut group, if you will, will continue to be that middle age population who's not coming in. So probably, you know, early 20s to mid 30s, we've got to figure out some strategies to convince them to come in and get vaccinated for additional coverage. Uh, this, this shows you the running total of vaccines that we've administered so far in terms of number and volume. Uh, again, this breaks down the primary sites where people are accessing and getting their vaccines. Uh, continues to be the county apparatus in terms of the different sites as well as our mass vac site uh, in Germantown. And this breaks down the distribution uh, by each week by age. Um, and as we can see now, again, it, this makes perfect sense because we pretty much saturated the older populations um, since we hit them first. Uh, and we're starting to see an uptick in the younger groups come in and get vaccinated. We certainly need to see even more uh, of those folks coming in so we can increase the percentage of our residents covered. Uh, this breaks down uh, vaccine rates over by race and ethnicity, looking at it for by uh, age group. You can see that the gaps between groups has continued to shrink significantly when comparing white residents versus black residents and white residents versus our Hispanic residents. Uh, this is our geographic breakdown again, and we are working to focus on those, those zip codes that remain uh, in the red to do some focused outreach efforts to get folks vaccinated and to understand why those numbers lag behind the rest of the county. Uh, and similarly, those focused efforts are undergoing, are being, are undergoing to address those under 65 as well. This is just another geographic representation looking at the percentage of those who've received the first dose, comparing it also to the percentage of those who've been fully vaccinated. Uh, we did uh, talk uh, previously, we put a lot of energy into pre-registration because we were, we were utilizing an appointment system given the uh, lower supply of doses available. Now, as Dr. Stoddard will likely share with you some more details about our shift in scheduling, uh, we have pretty much gone through and exhausted the list, pre-registration list that we have for the county, as well as the pre-registration list provided to us by the state. And we will be pivoting to a new type of scheduling that basically is equivalent to walk up, uh, walk up the availability for vaccines at the different sites. We did do a bit of a pilot uh, project with that on yesterday at our mass vac site using Johnson and Johnson doses. I want to say we vaccinated over 400 individuals using that platform. Um, and so we will be releasing more details about that and how community members will be able to access all of the different sites utilizing that type of strategy. We continue to prioritize equity. Uh, again, looking at our priority, our top tier zip codes based upon the impact of community transmission and COVID related illness. And that actually concludes the slideshow. And I learned a new trick today in terms of using F11 on your screen to blow it up. 
learning never stops. Um, and I think the other updates to, to put out there, we continue since we last met, um, obviously the Johnson & Johnson doses were um, approved for use. We as the health department did not receive any further doses of the Johnson & Johnson dose last week. We did see an increase in our doses back to uh, 9,000 doses for the local health department. Uh, the, all of our doses have been Pfizer and Moderna. There were approximately 16,000 Johnson & Johnson doses, I think 16,800 Johnson & Johnson doses sent from the state to different entities across the state, including hospitals and other places. And I think a, maybe a couple hundred of those doses went to one health department, but the overall majority did not uh, make it to the health departments in this turn. Uh, and we don't have any further information, at least I don't have any further information in terms of what the longer term strategy will be in terms of utilizing um, Johnson & Johnson doses for that. Um, I would also like to emphasize that, and we've talked a lot about this before, is our efforts to provide vaccination to our homebound population. As you recall from last week's conversation, we surveyed uh, all of the folks who had indicated, or the, inf the folks that we had information for in our pre-registration information who indicated homebound status. And we surveyed them to get an understanding if they still needed a vaccine. And we, we did that both through email as well as through phone call and we've broken that down by individuals who still need vaccines, who live in those priority zip codes versus those who don't. Um, and we are staffing up in partnership with our uh, colleagues in aging and disability to be able to support that effort uh, towards the end of the week to continue to make our way through that list. I think we identified close to 200 individuals who answered the survey and were able to, we were able to contact and get in touch with uh, to be able to provide those vaccines with primarily utilizing the Johnson & Johnson doses. As you recall, we had 284 of those doses remaining uh, from when there was a pause, and we'll use that tranche of doses to get that first wave of folks who we've been able to successfully contact, uh, get them vaccinated again, hopefully by the end of the week. We continue to support our community partners in terms of providing doses to support their efforts to get folks vaccinated in the community through again a diverse set of locations as well as measures. And as pointed out, we are in ongoing discussions to figure out how to create some opportunities that are youth and adolescent focused uh, to get our younger population vaccinated. I know that um, there's been discussions related to that involving the communications aspect, and our team has been working on looking at logistics in terms of how to best be able to provide that, whether that would be going to schools directly or creating central sites for adolescents and young adults to come in. We're also continuing to work with um, our team around issues of, uh, around consent to make sure that all of those um, issues are taken care of so that the process is seamless and smooth for young people being able to come in and access that opportunity. Um, I will stop there. Uh, Dr. Bridgers, did I miss anything from public health side? Good morning, all. Uh, Dr. Gale, I think you covered everything. The only thing that I would add to our homebound vaccination strategy is as follow up to, excuse me, uh, councils asked, Last week, and in particular, Council Member Rice, we did reach out over the weekend to those non-governmental organization and all of those organizations that provide services to homebound individuals. We're working with our agency and um, disability services. So not only looking at those individuals who are homebound, but their caretakers as well. And so as Dr. Gales indicated, based on the amount of vaccines that we have remaining, remember we had 280 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine remaining before. The, the pause in their administration. We've identified uh, 211 folks who are immediately ready to get vaccinated and our team is reaching out to them. Um, testing still continues to be uh, part of our equation. So to all those listeners who haven't gotten vaccinated and you are in the community, please consider getting tested if you feel sick or, or are symptomatic and encourage others to get tested as we collaboratively work through this. I'll stop there. Subject to any questions, Dr. Gales, I need to depart from this call and go to another call. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers. Dr. Snyder? 
Good morning. Good morning. I'll have a few pieces to add. Just a little more detail about the mass vaccination site. So we began the week this week at the mass vaccination site with approximately 3,600 doses of the Pfizer vaccine, 2,700 doses of the Moderna vaccine, uh, and uh, 1,300 Johnson and Johnson doses left over from before the pause. Yesterday, well, so so actually, we when I say began the week, we actually received the Pfizer and Moderna doses yesterday afternoon, I believe, and are utilizing them beginning today. So yesterday, all we had was Johnson and Johnson. We did have an opportunity to have 1,300 appointments made, but we only had about 393 people show up yesterday. So it tells you that there is still some hesitancy around the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, particularly. I am pleased to say, though, that the remainder of the clinics, which were scheduled with Pfizer through the rest of the week, uh, have been filling up. And they have, I think, approximately 1,300 appointments per day. And I think most of the days are over, you know, 1,000 appointments uh, already. At least today, we're already over 1,000 appointments. We'll take the remainder of all those that we've already started to receive four minutes ago. Sorry, I, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if you could um, lean a little closer to the mic. I'm sorry, I just can't hear you. Yeah, so we got 1,300 doses a day uh, at the uh, Pfizer for the rest of the week, uh, at least through into Friday, then we'll move over to the Moderna, either on Friday or on Monday, depending on how fast the uptake of the Pfizer vaccine is this week. Um, we uh, will do walk-ups every day, 10 to 2.30 every day at the, at the Montgomery College Germantown site. Uh, so people are welcome to just, if you want to make an appointment, you won't have to wait in line when you arrive. You'll go right into your appointment time. If you if you just want to if you have a few minutes at your lunch break and you want to run over and get vaccinated, we're going to accommodate you there too. So uh, obviously we are interested in getting people in to be vaccinated. Um, the one thing I will note in this, uh, Council Member Reamer, in response to your inquiry this morning, we have, looking at the vaccination numbers, I compared our our Monday through Sunday total last week with the previous five weeks before that. And in total, so week over week, last week we saw a 19% reduction in vaccine uptake across all sources, not just the county, all county residents uh, uptake pre compared to the previous week and a 25% reduction from the average of the previous five weeks before that. And so this is consistent with numbers that are being seen across the country. So this is not a Montgomery County specific phenomenon. Uh, we are seeing a reduction in vaccine uptake, and, and I, 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 I speculate that it's, number one, we, the people who are really, were really going to to get the vaccine have largely gotten it, and now we're moving into that next tier, which is not necessarily the people who are hesitant, but the people who have other barriers or impediments or, who, or for whom there isn't the same sense of urgency to get vaccinated that the first group included. And so, uh, to be clear, I don't think we're in this population we are we are certainly dealing with the population that says I don't want to be vaccinated and we're trying to encourage them to be vaccinated but I also think the intermixed among them are people who are willing to be vaccinated if the opportunity is is made more convenient closer to them easier to access time time hours of operation are better weekends all those things where we're trying to broaden the opportunities at all the sites while simultaneously as Dr. Gales alluded to getting closer into where people live and work and so we're doing both of those things concurrently. And I think that will help us uh, continue to move forward, but maybe not at the pace that we had been four weeks ago. Uh, and so I think that's all I wanted to cover this morning. Um, and I think we're happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Council Member Rice. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And unfortunately, Dr. Bridger stepped off before I could thank him directly, uh, but really want to thank all of you for uh, continuing to provide ways in which some of our homebound, some of our folks that are out there uh, continue to get connected and utilizing the resources of folks that are out there working with this population. So again, just want to thank you and say job well done. I did want to follow up on something uh, that I saw in the District of Columbia and just wondering what we may be doing here with regards to, and I'll take it twofold. Um, one, for businesses who are now looking at requirements for folks vaccinated and looking at proof of vaccination. So wanted to see what our thoughts are here, but then also when it comes to the businesses themselves and requiring proof of vaccination for their employees. So not just for patrons, but for employees as well. So if you could just share with me uh, the thoughts around this and where you think jurisdictions are headed, where the state of Maryland may be headed. I know that I just saw uh, the governor announced that he's now providing $100 incentives uh, to employees to become uh, vaccinated. And so I know there's a big push for employees uh, to be vaccinated, whether it's incentivizing them via pay or requirements. 
can you just share a little bit about what the thoughts may be there? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rice, for the question. Uh, you have actually touched on an area that I think uh, will be interested to see how it rolls out in terms of how to leverage technology and uh, in terms of vaccine confirmation, whether it's restaurants or travel or work. Um, and that is an open market right now where there, there are lots of different, I think, options that have been put forward. I know that, uh, for example, I believe it's St. Mary's County has uh, tried using a technology platform within that, and we've been investigating that, looking into that. Um, we've also pushed this, you know, and as in all of our efforts, we always ask the state if the state is going to take a larger effort for sake of standardization and uniformity across the state. Um, and I don't have any further details to say, you know, the state is looking at this particular option, um, but it is something that we're looking into. Um, the DC platform is something else I, you know, happened to read about yesterday and was made aware of over the weekend. And we're looking into that to see would that be feasible to do on a county level. And also if, if and when the state is going to do something, if it would be um, complementary to, to whatever is put in place there. Um, and I think from the perspective of work, I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I won't get into, I'll try not to, to step into the, the to that. Um, I do think that you, I, I don't know all the parameters of, you know, employees being able to require and mandate their staff to have the vaccine. I do know that they are able to ask, um, you know, the status if an individual is vaccinated. I'm not sure of all of the different parameters around um, you know, requiring that and then, you know, but to the piece about being able to follow and track right now, you know, even in the absence of technology, folks still do have their vaccine cards and are able to confirm their vaccine status through that way. Well, thank you very much for that. And just my last quick question is just going to be around Pfizer and for our younger uh, uh, cohorts. I hear that the FDA may sometime this week uh, come up with uh, some guidance. And so my question is, do we now pre-plan by opening up a pre-registration portal for those that are uh, of that 12 to 15 cohort? And the only reason why I ask this is we are looking at uh, summer school uh, and we just heard from MCPS that summer school will be the most robust opportunity. I know that many of us who are parents or have children or know of children who are in the system, we just got updates yesterday uh, and a portal was opened up for uh, that summer school. Uh, we're preparing for the fall. And so from that, I know many parents are anxious summer camps that are out there and different types of programs. Uh, folks are really inching for uh, that opportunity. And so from that perspective, would that be something that we could go ahead and start doing uh, just to make sure that when it does happen, we'll already have a robust cohort of uh, folks that we can go ahead and reach out to and schedule appointments for. Well, I hope this is an answer you like, Council Member Rice. We are already working on that, uh, and we have uh, engaged with our um, colleagues in uh, MCP. Yes, as well as we did have some outreach from at least one of our networks of non-public schools to engage in that conversation. And so the team actually, we did discuss this this morning, in fact, um, with that news to look through some different strategies. And I know that Councilmember Reamer had brought this up in previous conversation, Councilmember Albanos. So we're looking at trying to figure out the best way to do that and deliver. Uh, particularly given, as Dr. Stoddard mentioned, you know, a shift to a walk-up type scheduling uh, mechanism. So stay tuned. Um, it is being worked on, and certainly we will be reaching out to you all uh, for some ideas and input as we flesh some of those logistical details out more. I would just add that because we know it's only Pfizer, and so the shifting of the you know, Moderna for those that are older, and I'm not going to get into what you guys do in terms of your planning because you do such a great job of it, um, but certainly one in which from a regional logistical perspective, we need to consider that as well because, again, these are children who aren't going to be able to drive anywhere, so they'll likely have to have their parents that are taking them. Some will need public transportation, and so from that perspective, logistics will be a challenge, and so it will be important for us to have it in multiple areas, and so that's why having the pre-registration or having that kind of understanding of where the folks are who want it will help us in being able to deliver it effectively, understanding this is a different group from what we've had before to where we can expect folks to be able to go all around. So just wanted to share that with you, but I know you guys 
uh, thank you for doing the work uh, behind the scenes and making it happen. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Back to you, sir. Thank you, Council Vice President Albernoz. Um, thank you so much. I want to pick up where, um, well, actually, I want a, a personal note. I got my second shot on Friday, um, had no symptoms. Uh, I, I, my arm was just a tiny bit sore, but no more sore than it is when I got my flu shot or when I get my flu shot every year. And I know it has impacted people differently. And I've also heard that there are some folks who may be reluctant to get their second shot, at least in part because of the negative stories they've heard among friends or family members who who uh, got a little bit sick, you know, after the second shot. I'm just happy to report I didn't get sick. I still would have gotten it even if I had, um, but just want to counter some of the challenging stories out there with positive ones. So um, want, want to make sure our residents know that. And, and I should note my parents also uh, did not experience any symptoms after their second shots either. Uh, so I, I you know, it, it, it impacts people differently. Um, I just want to pick up where Councilmember Rice left off. Um, obviously, tremendous news that is early as a week from now, we may be able to start vaccinating children as young as 12. Um, we're uniquely positioned here to have a pediatrician as the director of our public health uh, infrastructure. Dr. Gerals, are we working with pediatricians? Because I know parents are, are probably going to have questions. Um, and it's uh, to, to Council Member Rice's point, you know, there's unique challenges with every demographic uh, as they, you know, go through the logistics of trying to secure the vaccination. In this case, there may be some additional questions that families and parents maybe feel most comfortable asking the pediatricians. Has there any been talk of any alliance there um, with our providers, with our medical providers? Sure. Well, the state has actually been actively working with the pediatric community around messaging and, you know, to, you know, to your point, to get, you know, make sure that population has adequate information. We haven't had as much local outreach given the efforts from the state and working with the different uh, professional societies around that. Um, and, I, and to your other point, too, hopefully that there we will see a further increase in the amount of doses so that potentially pediatric providers will be able to have doses in their offices, recognizing that you mentioned a lot of folks do feel more comfortable going to their personal pediatrician, um, as opposed to, you know, it might be a little bit more intimidating or off-putting to go to a larger site and be more, in, you know, impersonal in that setting. So there's a couple efforts uh, in, including the increased education, uh, encouraging pediatric providers to, you know, register and make sure they have vaccine on site in their offices as an additional resource uh, for parents to be able to take their kids to get the vaccine. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. I think those are all my questions for now. I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on the homebound seniors, if I understood what you said, uh, Dr. Stoddard, or maybe Dr. Gales, uh, we have we have worked our way through the whole list. I just ask because I have been in dialogue with a resident who's trying to get their parent a homebound visit and hasn't been hasn't received any contact. So, could you give us a quick summary again of the homebound and what should someone do now if that is their status? Sure. Thank you, Councilman Marima. So we've worked through the uh, the names that we have through our pre-registration portal that we, you know, we, that we're collected that way. And so, if there is still someone who is working through uh, trying to get a vaccine, I'm sorry that it's taken some time. But if you will provide us with their information, we'll make sure to include them and have members of our scheduling team reach out to them to okay. make sure that they're included in the list. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good conversation here on students, and thank you for continuing your work uh, to build a plan there. I'd like to make the uh, suggestion that we think about how to really motivate kids at this time um, to get vaccinated themselves and to even make their families want to bring them to get vaccinated. What if we were to offer free movie passes and free meals at, like, a pizza restaurant or a local, you know, restaurant that of which there are that kids love that they're all around the the, the county uh, for kids who go in to get their vaccination. Sixteen and all ups, they can self. If I understand correctly, they don't need parental permission. So our high school students could take advantage of the opportunity on their own volition. They could turn it into 
you know, a Friday afternoon, we're all going to get our shots and then we're going to go out and get a movie and we're going to get a meal. Um, and then the younger kids, as that opens up, you know, it could be something where all the kids are coming home to their, to their parents and saying, you know, mom, mom, you know, mom, dad, like, can we do this? So I, I tried to just crunch the numbers. If we, if we said, if we budgeted 15 bucks a student and we got, you know, 30,000 students, it's only a couple hundred thousand dollars. Seems like that would be well worth a well worthwhile expenditure, given the critical demographic that we're trying to target. Um, and you know, I think the fact, is, as we're seeing from the changing pace of vaccinations, as 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 you've said, we're going to have to work harder now. You know, the, the easier not nothing anything was easy, but the easier part, in a sense, is is sort of behind us. The harder part is ahead of us, and we're we're probably going to need to work harder. You know, to get all the way to the finish line. So I, I've been in uh, a planning process with the vaccine hunters, and they are very excited about, as teachers, bringing home some of that work to their, to the school community, uh, as well as, you know, other efforts to kind of create more community excitement about, about coming out and getting vaccinated. vaccinated. And we just, we, we came up with this idea of providing an incentive. And I just was curious if that was something we could explore as a follow-up, um, and I, you know, you're already building the groundwork with some of the transportation logistics and things like that. But uh, I, we've seen New Jersey have a similar measure targeted towards more young adults with a, a free beer uh, from a local brewery, which would be cool if we could do that too. But um, you know, I thought maybe starting with kids might be the, you know, the most appropriate uh, place to start for us because we've got a very limited window before they sort of disperse for the summer, recognizing that we'll be able to reach some through summer camps. But anyway, any any planning that you might, or any comments you have or planning you might want to share about that, and, and I'd love to follow up with you and the, the vaccine hunters to talk about uh, how we might be able to work on something like that. Uh, well, as, as you referenced, uh, there are a lot of uh, different locales that are using a host of different incentives to encourage uh, vaccination uh, from, you know, West Virginia. I think the governor is providing $100 savings bonds to, to folks um, and a free beer in New Jersey. So there's variation within that. You know, incentives do have a, a role in that and can be impactful. I think, you know, we're waiting to see if, you know, a few more data points in terms of, of how it, it works in terms of the vaccine space. But as far as our team, we've been focused entirely on the logistical aspect of things and scheduling. We haven't, uh, you know, done any, had any conversations about utilization of, of incentives, but we'd be happy to talk with you offline about it more and and what that could potentially look like. Cool, thank you, I'll follow up. Lastly, case rates are declining, it's so welcome. Um, you know, I, I hope this progress continues uh, and, and we'll obviously see as we progress through May, you know, where, where cases are. But, um, you know, it is such a relief to see this downward trend and to be well below 100, you know, which it was concerning that we were continuing to be above 100. Uh, but to see us on that downward path now, I'm, I'm very hopeful about where we'll be by the end of May. Um, and, you know, I, I think we'll, we'll want to try to think, uh, you know, weeks ahead of that. But if that were, that's where we seem to be heading to a lower, very low number by the end of May, um, you know, I think we might want to, we'll need to revise our framework again. But thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Freed. Thank you. Uh, echoing the comments everyone has made, it's exciting that uh, we're getting ready as a country to start uh, potentially vaccinating young people and expanding the eligibility. Uh, great to see the numbers uh, in Montgomery County in particular where they are, uh, a testament to uh, folks following public health guidance. That they're only as good as uh, those who are willing to uh, adhere to them. And so the sacrifice that Residents are making, businesses are making, we can't say it enough. That is what is working and has to continue. We hope it will continue and just wanted to thank all of our residents, all of our businesses for all of their efforts. Um, I did have a quick question on um, the vaccinations out of state. I know Dr. Stoddard, you were working on uh, taking a look at the CDC numbers and, and and going through that just wanted to see if we could get a status report to see uh, you know the, the good news is 38 percent according to our numbers of those in uh the state of maryland have been 
uh, vaccinated, uh, if we include those who've been vaccinated in other states, DC, Virginia, and elsewhere, uh, that number is uh, likely to be higher, potentially significantly higher. Um, and so I just wanted to check to see where that effort was. Yes, yeah, so number's 42.3%. As Dr. Gales alluded to when he was talking through, we, we are reconciling uh, the two difference. And uh, I, I think we're inclined to utilize a number that we believe is more accurate, which if they're, if they're, you know, they are accounting for out of state and federal vaccination efforts that are not included in the state immunet number. So uh, in terms of displaying on the website, the only, the only trouble there is that we lose, if we eliminate utilizing uh, state immunet data, uh, we lose the ability to do the bifurcation by age group and other things like that. And so we probably just need to include both and that's what we're working on. So you can see the more detailed immunet data where you can go in and see slices of age categories and racial demographics and all of those other things. Whereas the CDC has a, or has a better full population number, but does not break it down in the same ways by race and ethnicity and age and things like that that we want to be able to see. And so I think we're trying to figure out how we can utilize both numbers to show, to tell different stories or to tell a more complete story. But I think in terms of uh, the Board of Health regulation, we're inclined to use the CDC number, not because it's higher and higher is better, but because I think it actually more accurately portrays the full vaccination efforts that are undergoing in our in our community, whereby a lot of our residents are uh, accessing opportunities in the district, in Northern Virginia, through federal partners and other places. So that number is 42.3 percent. So obviously, it's about four, 4.4 percent higher than our current numbers. Appreciate it. Well, that that is great. I, I totally understand the need to disaggregate the data and have the more detailed data, which we only have from the, the state. We worked very hard uh, as a county and as a, a council and executive and health department to get the disaggregated uh, data from the states. So I wouldn't want to lose that. It's I think been key to your efforts uh, to target populations uh, and make sure that we're hitting the uh, entire community. And so I, I wouldn't want to lose that, but I think if we're using the CDC number, which seems appropriate since it appears to be the most accurate available number that we have, and that's what is uh, being connected to the health order that uh, we ought to display it sooner rather than- I, I will note for the purposes of the regulation though, uh, the CDC number says fully vaccinated just the way our same, our webpage did previously. When they say fully vaccinated on the page with the vaccination, if you go down into the details, it's actually those who have completed their dose schedule, not the two weeks thereafter that we need to, re that we require for fully vaccinated. So, yeah, interestingly, so even on the CDC, percent, we'd have to be at 50% plus two weeks just to correct. be here for those. Correct. I, I wanted to make sure that was one of the big details we, we wanted to make sure on because obviously when, when CDC says fully vaccinated, I would, I would think that they would want to follow their own definition, but they're actually not. You, if you read through, if you read further down or on the page or on the descriptions of the, of the, of the actual metrics, it is actually just having received full dose to complement. Great. Okay. And I know the uh, website has been updated to refer to it as the full dose schedule as opposed to fully vaccinated, which would. Our page has, the CDC yeah, page yeah. still says fully vaccinated though. Right, right, right. I just, right. Yeah, yeah. Thanking you for the change to, to our website to clarify because we have to hit 50% and then add two weeks and that's when we would get to the final phase. Uh, okay, uh, the uh, young people, as that happens, I, I do think there's uh, an opportunity. I'll, I'll allow for uh, Councilmember Reamer's uh, idea uh, to, to be uh, vetted and, and thought through, but you know, I think the broader point of the schools being uh, a key point of entry that we have uh, that's fleeting uh, in June, if, if we could uh, work hard with uh, the school system uh, to come up with a, a strategy of, of reaching those now that it seems like we're turning the corner of potentially having more doses uh, and available uh, vaccines, uh, then reaching these young people as early as we can, particularly when we have them in one concentrated uh, area and a single point of entry would uh, really make a huge difference. I hope we can continue uh, with those conversations and move forward in that direction. So thank you. And with that, uh, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Glass. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, just like Councilmember uh, Albernaz last week getting getting a second shot, I too, got my second shot last Thursday and I got it at the Silver Spring Civic Building and uh, you know 
wanted to wait until more residents had been vaccinated until they uh, opened up availability uh, to, to all adults. And I wanted to do it at a, a county facility as well to see how those operations were running. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the operation ran very smoothly and efficiently and that everybody who was there was very helpful uh, and seemed to be glad to be there, recognizing that they were helping, you know, uh, ensure the health and safety of all of our residents here here in Montgomery County. And so I just uh, want to thank uh, uh, you both uh, for being here and for all of these conversations uh, and for uh, the ups and downs and sideways that had occurred over this last year, um, having not had a roadmap to get us to this point where 54% of Montgomery County residents have now received at least one dose and 38% have been fully vaccinated. So it is a, a testament to, to uh, the nimble nature of county government uh, and of course also uh, President Biden and fulfilling and exceeding his pledge to get more vaccinations uh, in the arms of all Americans. And uh, lastly, I just wanna thank uh, particularly the, the Medical Reserve Corps, a group of volunteers who've been doing yeoman's work. Uh, and each time I, I got vaccinated, uh, I had really nice conversations with neighbors and friends uh, and just regular county residents who are volunteering their time to help put shots in people's arms and to help, uh, to help the system uh, operate and so um, thank you to everybody who's who's helping out in that volunteer capacity. But back to the numbers, real quick. The only question I have: so the the update today was 54% of Montgomery County residents have received at least one dose, and 38% have received uh, have been fully vaccinated. And last week, uh, it was slightly more than 50% who had received one dose, and 34% who had been fully vaccinated. So clearly, uh, uh, a three to four point increase over the last week and so the question that i've been being uh, that i've gotten from so many people is when are we expected to reach the 60 percent threshold for fir first dose which we uh, codified as a benchmark in our health order last week uh, so dr stoddard or dr gales uh, what, what are the trend lines for getting us to that 60 percent uh, magic number Uh, thank you, Councilmember Glass, uh, for your question. Utilizing the, the numbers that you shared with us, uh, and in concert with the fact that we have seen some uh, decreases in terms of folks coming through the doors, if you will, in terms of demand for the first dose, I suspect that we'll probably see more of a bump in the fully vaccinated number, uh, at least in the short term, because all of those folks who a month ago or three weeks ago who came through the gates to get vaccinated will be getting their second shot. And the challenge will be getting that first number to increase more, which means we're bringing more people in. So if we're increasing by, I think we have been a little bit more bearish uh, in terms of our prediction. Uh, if we're increasing by three to four percent on a weekly basis, you're looking at probably a two to three week window. Um, given where we are now, 54%, I would speculate, uh, given one of the things that has changed um, for the, the the good part of that is that, you know, our allocation of doses increased from 7,000 to 9,000. So we're getting more doses now um, into circulation, which hopefully means more doses into arms. So I think we're probably looking at a seven to 10 day period at the earliest best case scenario before we would hit that 60% marker. And I functionally think what's happening is actually what, what we're going to actually see is maybe the 60% is delayed a little bit, but the 50% fully vaccinated number isn't really. And I think that's what Dr. Yell's alluding to. So we may see a little bit longer before we get the second phase, but the third phase has probably not changed a whole lot. So it just may mean that we move from the second phase to the third phase faster than we would have and we're in the first phase a little bit longer is, is functionally what I think is going to happen if, we're, if the numbers tell us. And I was just looking at the data while we're talking. Dr. Spotter, we're having um, uh, some audio issues, yeah. Yeah, so two, two Mondays ago, uh, we were at 46.9%, uh, so we folks we got about 7% in the last two weeks. So that's that 3.5% number that you alluded to. And so obviously, if you take, we're 54 right now, two weeks, a little bit less, 
perhaps. Maybe, you know, if, we're, if we are truly slowed down, maybe it's three weeks, but I think that's probably the timeline. Sure, and, and, and this is where it gets harder, right? Because all of the evidence is showing that there are, are geopolitical uh, dynamics at play where the uh, those in less urban, less dense areas, and this is national, right? Trend lines here in, in the state, but certainly nationally, uh, are more hesitant or unlikely to get shots. And we have spent the last year, uh, county government, uh, making sure that those in underserved areas here in our community, urban and suburban underserved areas had the resources that they need and uh, it and and we're we're closing those gaps as as you noted uh, which is a very good thing another testament to the the dedication uh, to our uh, belief that uh, equity is important but are we seeing those same uh, trend lines regarding the geo political uh, hesitation here in the county? Are there the zip codes that uh, the underserved area or the, the areas that are not getting vaccinated, not because of access, but because of choice? I think it's a combination of a lot of those factors. Um, I don't think it's necessarily one or the other. I think uh, there are reasons specific within each geographic location that may be a little bit different from others. Um, I do think that there still continues to be issues of access and barriers to being able to get it. I also think that for some, there is still uh, a little bit of hesitancy around it. Um, and then I do think for, for others, there are some uh, more political or ideological reasons behind why they're choosing not to get it. What we're trying to focus on is continuing to make sure that in any form of our operation that we have removed as many obstacles and barriers as possible. So for those who want to get it, to make it as uh, low barrier entry points as possible for them. Um, and for those who still have some issues around uh, you know, hesitancy, prioritizing those focused campaigns that we talked about early on in the presentation. Particularly, it seems to be the sweet spot for that is whether it's hesitancy or just not coming in is in that mid, mid 20s to mid to late 30s group uh, where we're seeing lower uptake. And so figuring out that I know that the comms team has been working um, over the last week to do some focused messaging to that population. And the third piece is, you know, going very proactively and aggressively to those groups that, uh, for example, are young people that represent thousands of, of individuals that do also count to the, you know, the ultimate number of people covered and would provide a great source of protection for them as they continue to move around as well as to their, their other family members. And to the last piece with those who have an ideological difference about vaccines, you know, I think the best we can do is continue to, you know, make opportunities available, um, demonstrate and show the data in terms of the effectiveness of the operation so far and the effectiveness of the vaccines. Um, but, you know, really focus a lot of our energy, not completely dismiss that group, but, you know, continue to focus a lot of our energy and resources on those other populations that we mentioned where we do know that there is a significant demand for the vaccine. I, I agree with that, right? Let's let's focus the energy on uh, residents who want to get the vaccine but are unable to do so for a host of reasons that that we have been working through uh, throughout this crisis on various levels. Uh, but the the concern that some in the community have shared with me is that the anti-vaxxers, those who choose not to, uh, and for all intents and purposes will not, uh, on their own accord, uh, get vaccinations, that they don't hold us back in reaching our goal and doing what we have to do to uh, return to some semblance of normal. And so it is that balancing act. Uh, and uh, I've seen some creative things that other jurisdictions and other states are doing to try and encourage 20 year olds uh, to get vaccinated. And, and Council Member Reamer alluded to some of them. Uh, and so certainly worth exploring more. But uh, the bottom line is that we have uh, dedicated ourselves over this last year to to helping those who need assistance in accessing services and accessing testing and accessing vaccines. And let's uh, continue doubling and tripling down on that to, to get them the help that they need so that we reach that 60% threshold uh, and we can return to some semblance of normal here in Montgomery County. So I look forward to working with you uh, to reach those, uh, those important benchmarks. And uh, thank you again for everything that you've been doing. Thank you, Mr. President.
Uh, thank you, Councilmember Glass. Um, while I wait to see if any other colleagues want to speak, I'll just jump in with a couple questions I had. Did you, maybe I missed it, but is there any uh, update on library guidance? Yeah, we actually had a meeting on, I was going to say, we had, sorry, I was, I was uh, struggling to get unmuted. We did have a meeting uh, <laughs> the the executive and, trying to be muted there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, on uh, Friday uh, to discuss this. I, honestly, I thought that there was going to be a final agreement on Friday, but apparently um, there's still a few more things to work on. Um, it's uh, it, it's still under discussion. Yes, it's We're imminent. Waiting, uh, I mean, I would describe it as imminent. There, I mean, it seemed to me like the, the last few um, uh, boxes had to be checked, particularly for, you know, uh, exactly how the, because I mean, there's essentially, without just going too far into this, uh, they're working on a sort of, a, you know, a, a, an appointment system work to, to help, to help. We don't want people to be turned away when they come to libraries because there are too many people in accessing the library based on the occupancy uh, limitations. And so we want to make sure that there's opportunity for people to know when they show up that they're going to be able to, to come in and there's going to be sort of an appointment model for, for computer time and things like that. And so there were some details on that that were still being worked out as of Friday in terms of the cleaning of stations and things like that. And so... That, those are the last few details that need to be worked out. So, I, again, I know we've said this for a couple of times, but based on my meeting with the county executive, met with uh, libraries and rec, and I, I was privy to that meeting, it is, it is incredibly close to being done. Okay. Well, you know, actually, we've, there's been um, commentary on social media about why are they different than, say, retail bookstores. And you just answered part of the question of we want people to be able to access a computer and do... Uh, access some of the additional services that are there that aren't available in retail stores. Is that the right? That's exactly. I mean, and, and, and that's those are the areas because we know that, for example, computer use. There are not many other venues that have computer use, and so right. we know that that's one of the more popular services offered by the libraries, and becomes one of the the, the the key bottlenecks where you have too many people coming to the to access that particular service. Not, not less from a safety pers perspective, but rather the resident coming and not being able to utilize the service that they've come all the way out to utilize and figure out exactly how we can make sure that that can be done both safely and not having people turned away when they arrive and things like that. So we're really trying to work on how, you know, that was the systems that, that we had to work through and, and make sure that um, those were in place and also that the um, the employees were comfortable with how those were operating. And so that, that's the, those are the last things that were being worked on. Okay, avoiding resident frustration by missed appointments and stuff, right? right. Okay, services yeah. not being available. Um, thanks. I wanted to, uh, I should thank you for the good news around um, the homebound population, um, and thanks for the outreach uh, over the phone as well. Um, the other thing that ju just occurred to me, maybe you addressed this too, but once our, va well, our vaccination percentage uh, relies on um, the percentage of eligible residents that are vaccinated, not all residents. Once 12 year olds are el and up are eligible. No, Dr. Gales, correct me. It's all residents. Um, all residents. It actually works in our favor because what's going to happen next week is that three to 4% of our population, if, if the CDC approves, the FDA, the right. FDA approves, that will become eligible that weren't. And right. so we do use the full population numbers. And so we could actually see a spike. As early as next week or the following right. week, okay. when, when you know younger younger adults become eligible. That's my question. I remember the debate. Thanks for correcting my memory. Okay, because uh, those those are related. Um, okay. Any other colleagues that want have a question want to speak? We were behind, but now we've caught up. Great. Okay. Thanks for all your great work for our residents. We really appreciate it. Thank you all, and stay safe. Thank you. Um, okay, colleagues, now we can have action on amendments to the county government's FY21 to 26 capital improvement program, certain White Flint projects, and a resolution to amend resolution 161570, the White Flint sector implementation strategy and infrastructure improvement list. Uh, this has been recommended by both the uh, GO committee and the TE committee as amended. Does the GO committee chair have any remarks? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Council President. Uh, so <clears throat> the joint committees um, did meet on this 
resolution, with, resolution which was introduced on February 9th. Uh, we did have a public hearing on March 9th. I want to thank um, Mr. Gene Smith for uh, his um, packet and also his recommendations. Um, let me just say that um, <clears throat> just for a little bit of history, the county created this taxing district to accelerate transportation projects um, in that district because we recognize the importance of the area for economic development efforts in the county. Um, and as you can see uh, in the packet, the council and the executive have worked collaboratively with stakeholders throughout 2010, actually did work throughout 2010 to consider the policies necessary to implement a special taxing district. Uh, of course, a lot has, has happened since 2010. Uh, and we also know that um, the county has committed um, to the uh, Washington Council of Government's housing goals by 2030. Uh, and we understand that White Flint obviously plays a significant role in that particular effort. Um, and as you will see, the recommendations from the joint uh, committees are the first step uh, that the council considers how to address some unforeseen issues when the district was approved in, 20, uh, was approved in 2010. Um, we know that the executive um, staff has known about these issues for some time. Um, but this is the first time that the council is seeing a proposal to change the taxing district policies. And while the council considers the executive's proposal, um, I also hope that we can remember the importance of capitalizing and reinforcing the county's economic development goals and continuing our collaborative efforts with stakeholders in the White Plains District to succeed. Um, so when we uh, met as joint um, committees, we did review the executive's uh, recommended approach to funding those certain projects in White Flint. Those included a repayment plan for the district and amendments to the CIP projects. Uh, and uh, we actually, the joint committee did not support the executive's approach um, and financing plan for the White Flint Special Taxing District. Um, and uh, what we did is that unanimously, we made the following uh, recommendations and I'll just read them and then uh, Mr. Smith can add or clarify any uh, particular things that I have I maybe uh, have left out. Uh, so we approved um, the following to amend the White Flynn West Workaround project and to use the $15 million in general obligation bond premium in FY21, including the executive's recommended expenditure schedule and repayment period from FY33 to 43 for this funding advance. Also to amend the resolution 16-1570 uh, to allow the wife workaround work around to proceed without interruption. The two narrowly tailored amendments allow for the use of geo bond premium and lift the county general fund advance cap for that project only. To approve the other wife win PDF as recommended by the committees and the executive recommended certain fiscal notes amendments to the other district CIP projects. The committees did not support those amendments because the council and not approve the repayment plan yet. And um, we also strongly uh, supported the recommendation for uh, the executive staff, council staff, and relevant district stakeholders to continue efforts to identify an acceptable repayment plan for the district. Um, and the committees did not put a deadline on the work, but we expect, um, we uh, it is expected to conclude so that the council can consider it later this year. So. Basically, we understand that there were some there was some urgency um, to act, uh, especially uh, when it came to the $15 million in general obligation bond premium. Um, but the issue of the repayment plan and some of those other uh, particulars, we believe that it is important for there to be a bit more um, conversation with the stakeholders, such as the Friends of White Flint, um, so that there could be a hopefully um, consensus around how to move forward. Um, and again, we also recognize the important role that White Flint and the projects and the vision uh, plays in overall uh, economic development for us as well. So so that was the joint committee recommendation, Mr. Smith. I don't know if there are any other pieces that I may have left out. Um, and, uh, and then it's basically no. Okay, so that is what's in front of us uh, from the joint committee. Thank you so much, Mr. President and co-chair. Great, the t &E chair fully concurs. Any discussion by our colleagues? Okay, we have a joint committee recommendation in front of us. All those in favor, please raise your hand. 
That appears unanimous among those present. Great. Now we can have uh, action on a special appropriation to the FY21 operating budget, the Office of County Executive Connected DMV Contract Global Pandemic Prevention Center. Let me call on the esteemed chair of the Fed Committee. Thank you, Mr. Council President. I want to thank you and I want to thank all my colleagues and the county executive uh, for working together in partnership with Connected DMV with a regional nonprofit economic development organization on what is a really exciting initiative uh, with tremendous potential. We are, we are discussing here today to whether to approve an appropriation that will have the county make an investment in their strategic planning process and outreach to build support for a major federal initiative with public and private sector funding to better prepare us for future pandemics. The specific project that Connected DMV has focused on to begin is something that I think we're all more familiar with today than we would have been several years ago, which is the idea of stockpiling monoclonal antibodies for the top known pathogens. Uh, the COVID-19 was known, it was a coronavirus, it was known. Uh, but the private sector really will struggle to take, to do research and to take treatments through clinical trial for pathogens that are known, but that are not out in the wild. And so a number of leading scientists with support from the Gates Foundation have come together with this as a sort of spearhead to a new major federal public-private initiative. And we are, we are fortunate that Montgomery County is agreed upon by everyone involved at this stage that it, it, Montgomery County is the natural home for this initiative. And so our appropriation, uh, and again, I wanna thank my colleagues and the county executives team for working this through with Connected DMV. Uh, this appropriation is to secure our status uh, as a leader in this initiative. Uh, we're grateful for the state for stepping up in support as well and to uh, build momentum and make it more possible that this will indeed come to fruition. So uh, Montgomery County is, is a leading center in the global pandemic response um, ecosystem. We are, we are a major center in that ecosystem and it has tremendous potential for us in terms of spinning out jobs and companies and continuing our momentum. So uh, you know, with, this, with this smart investment and it, you know, there's no sure thing here. We, we, we're well aware there's no sure thing here, but with this smart investment, we are making it more possible uh, that this brilliant vision will come to reality um, and, and further strengthen our own uh, role in global pandemic response and our own economic uh, prosperity. So um, excited to, to be here today and we have the appropriation before us uh, and we'll, you know, as in the coming months, we'll all we'll be working together on how to advance this with our federal partners and our, our federal delegation is, is aware and uh, I think eager to help us bring this across the finish line. So thank you. That is our, our recommendation. I thank Council Member Albernos, uh, particularly for joining with me early uh, to recommend this to colleagues. And, um, you know, we're, we're uh, glad we're moving forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Reamer. I misspoke. It's uh, GOHHS, Council Vice President Albernos. Thank you. I uh, definitely associate myself with all of the comments of Councilmember Reamer just now. This is an exciting opportunity, and oftentimes we focus on our challenges and liabilities and the, the obstacles before us here in Montgomery County. We don't focus enough on our assets. And we have a tremendous amount of assets here in our community. Um, there, there is a reason why I think we are well positioned uh, to move forward with a project like this. And it's because we are the epicenter of the health response nationally to the pandemic uh, with the NIH right here uh, and with so many federal government workers residing here in Montgomery County and in the DMV at large um, and so it, it, this is just a natural extension 
in many ways. And if we are successful, and of course it is a big if, there are many moving parts here, um, but it's important that we be at the table and aggressive uh, in our attempts to attract um, businesses, government agencies, and in this case, the other layer of being continuing to be at the epicenter of the response to the global pandemic, which is all something that we can be very proud of. So um, um, look forward to further discussions regarding this and further partnerships and alliances uh, with our federal delegation and many others uh, who will need to be part of this for it to be entirely successful. And I do also want to thank the county executive and his team uh, who have forged ahead with this as well um, and, and thank Councilmember Reaver for jumping on this early too. Thanks so much. Okay, Councilmember Reaver, do you want to move the approval? Uh, actually, I think Councilmember Navarro uh, was going to speak as well. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Navarro. Thank you so much. Uh, so this item did, item did come directly to the council, but it's actually a geo and HHS item um, because of the characteristics and because of what we hope will happen. Um, and I think this is a real clear example of you know being proactive and understanding how to leverage our assets there is no doubt and in the region we are well positioned and i would say nationally we are well positioned um, to further this work in an extraordinary way and given what we have just experienced and continue to experience there is no doubt that uh, being proactive is really key. So I think the stars are aligning with the Biden administration, understanding the importance of being proactive in this arena with our federal delegation, with the different federal agencies that we have in here in Montgomery County, as well as a very vibrant uh, biotech life science ecosystem. I think the stars are aligning so that uh, we can pursue this. So this is just the beginning and uh, do want to acknowledge also, the work of the administration, uh, Councilman Barim, Mara Bornos, maybe who have many who have started to work on this and envision this, but the entire council um, for agreeing that this is a worthwhile investment uh, and that we need to again just be, be sure to plan for the future. Uh, so I do look forward to this continuing to to uh, evolve and obviously for the HHS and, and GO committees and the full council to work on details, et cetera, as, as we move forward. Um, but this is definitely uh, an important piece of our narrative, as Council Member Alberno said, that usually we don't tout as much as we should, is that we do have the ingredients, we do have the particular elements uh, to pursue something of, of this type. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And Council Member DeBarro and I received a great briefing on this at the Council of Governments, which was very well received in, uh, a lot of got a lot of enthusiasm from our colleagues. Okay, anyone we else? We sure we sure did. We sure did. Yeah. Anyone else on this matter? Okay. Um, Councilmember Navarro, Albert knows. Do you want to move? We have the joint committee recommendation on this, right? Okay. All those in favor? No, it went it oh. went directly to council. Actually, this That's this right. just came directly to council um, because of you know making sure that we can work as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, we, but we obviously, in future. We had a joint yes. Fed HHS meeting that was scheduled and then we postponed it mm -hmm. um, and we decided to bring it to full council. So uh, I, anyway, that, that's right. that, that's the history there. Here we okay. are. Thank you. Okay. Thank so you. we have, uh, it's coming right before the council. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among all those present. Mr. Smith. I think somebody has to move it. No? Yeah, someone needs to have it. Mark. Let's see. Yeah. So moved. Since there's no committee recommendation. How, uh, Councilmember Reamer moves, Councilmember Freaks and seconds. All those in favor, please raise your hand again. Terrific. Unanimous among all those present. Now we need to suspend the rules of procedure to take up a resolution to indicate the council's intent to approve or reject provisions of the count collective bargaining agreement with the Montgomery County Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association. So moved. Is there a best the motion to suspend the rules of procedure? Is there a second? Second. Councilmember Navarro seconds. Councilmember Rice's motion. Terrific. Um, Chief Goldstein, welcome. Mr. Drummer, do you have anything to add? You, you may want to vote on the motion to suspend the rules before Fine. the, sure. the action. All those, all those in favor of re uh, suspending the rules, please raise your hand. 
Terrific. Unanimous among all those present. Mr. Drummer. Okay. Mr. Bernard. Uh, what you have before you is uh, a resolution to indicate the council's intent to either approve or not approve provisions in the collective bargaining agreement with the Montgomery County Volunteer uh, Firefighters, the MCVFRA. As you know, uh, since January of 2005, the county has been uh, negotiating collective bargaining agreements with the MCVFRA, who represents the individual local fire departments in the county, volunteer fire departments. Uh, the council has to approve any provision that requires an appropriation of funds or a change in law. The resolution, which is in the packet on page circle three, begins on circle three of the packet, uh, is the uh, list on circle four, the five items that are subject to council approval this year. This provision, this agreement covers only those items that either require a change in law or an appropriation of funds for FY22. Uh, and as you know, last year, the council rejected all the provisions in the collective bargaining agreement between the county and the, the executive and the MCF, MCVFRA. I think I'll start calling them just the volunteers. Keep getting that acronym wrong. Uh, as part of its same services budget. And uh, the executive agreed to send over a supplemental appropriation uh, if in fact certain certain things happened with the career firefighters, which did actually happen. The supplemental is not in front of you. That's FY21 money. This is FY22. Uh, but just so you understand the agreement here, it uh, includes the raises in the associate, in the, uh, in these five items that would have occurred in FY21 if not for the council's rejection of those items, as well as the increases in the agreement. It is a three-year agreement, and this would be going into its second year. Uh, the provisions that would, uh, inc the increases that would take effect for FY22. The provisions uh, are the association operating funds, which would be an increase of $26,141 over the amount provided uh, in FY20 and FY21. Training, which is a total of 15,000, which is actually the same as last year. The nominal fee would jump for, there's two tiers, depending on how many, uh, how much you work as a volunteer, uh, would go from 455 person to 525 a person or tier two 700 to 900 uh, the increase the total increase is one hundred nineteen thousand nine hundred thirty five dollars over what was last year there's a volunteer basic orientation course which is twenty one thousand dollars which the county has paid for as many years as I can remember uh, it's the same cost as last year. And then there's the length of service awards. Uh, this was, this agreement was before the public safety committee last week, last Thursday afternoon. Uh, the county, county executive had not yet at the time sent over the legislation that's required to implement the increases in the length of service awards program. Uh, since that time last Friday, the executive did submit legislation to implement that, uh, which would be introduced later. It hasn't been introduced yet. Uh, for your information, well, the Public Safety Committee approved 
uh, all of the provisions in the agreement that was sent over by the executive, uh, including the length of service awards in concept subject to getting the legislation. The legislation has now come forward. So the resolution that's in front of you includes all approval of all five items that I just mentioned. I will mention one other thing about the length of service awards legislation, which is not, the legislation is not actually in front of you, but the concept is, the approval is. Um, the legislation that came over includes some money that would be paid in FY21 this year. That's not really part of this approval. That's part of the supplemental appropriation that is not currently in front of you. But the bulk of the, the legislation does include the increases that are part of this agreement for FY22. So uh, whether or not you approve payments beginning in FY21 depend on the supplemental appropriation. But if you go along with the Public Safety Committee, you will be indicating your intent to approve the agreement as far as how it's affected in FY22. Uh, so that's what's in front of you. The Public Safety Committee voted 3 nothing in favor of the agreement. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Katz isn't here, but uh, Chief, Mr. Bernard, anything to add? If not, that's fine. Okay. I think we're good. Is there a motion to approve the resolution to indicate the council's intent? I move. Second. second. Councilmember Friedson moves. Councilmember Rice seconds. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Great. That is unanimous among those present. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Now we can take up the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Second. We're free to move. Councilmember Rice seconds the consent calendar. All those in favor of approving the consent calendar, please raise your hand. Unanimous among those present. Terrific. All right, colleagues, we caught up and we are on recess till 1.30. Thank you. With it. You know, this has been a big discussion. The residents.